Yes. And the chosen people of God, this this punishment for our wickedness is if if we have wickedness in our hearts, it's not our nation doesn't necessarily get punished with hurricanes in Texas. Right, because 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 we're not a geographic nation. The United States is not the church. The kingdom of God is the church and not the United States. It's a great distinction. So if there's punishment, it's on us as individuals or on us as a group, like this church possibly, if our church is doing wickedness. Yeah. That, that's where we may reap what we sow. Yeah, and, 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 and in that, we recognize that there's a difference between fatherly discipline and judgment to unbelievers who are pretending. Okay, so let's take a theologically liberal denomination who says that Jesus is not God and everyone's saved. Okay, that's, I mean, how, how far can you get from God's word than that? All right, and, and so that's a denomination where there's not belief, there's not regeneration. These are not God's people. They bear his name, but they bear his name in vain. Okay, and, and so... Those people are, are, are disciplined. So look at the PCUSA today and, and the massive decrease in numbers they have. Okay, it's like they're what, like a third of what they were in 1975. Uh, and, and so God judges denominations like that. Um, and, and so that's um, very much what we can see in the book of Judges where these people aren't believing. They're worshiping other gods. And, you know, I grew up in, in theological liberalism, and I know the God they worship is the God of the universe. Whatever the university is saying um, is what liberal churches say also. So just look at what's being said on, on a secular university campus, and that's what you'll hear from the pastor and in that church and from that church's denominational materials. Uh, and so they're not concerned at all. My Bible is somewhere. Um, okay, thanks. Um, they're not concerned at all. Hey, in my TV, I thought, oh, man, I left that in the car. Great. Um, they're not concerned at all with what the Bible says. In fact, they're embarrassed by the Bible. Um, and so, um, so, so that's, that would be judgment. Uh, God judges, and he, he, you know, and so they're losing buildings because no one's filling them. Um, you know, and in, in contrast to this, um, Bible-believing denominations are growing. The PCA keeps growing. We're actually one of two churches, two denominations that continues to grow. Um, it grew through COVID, even. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, so God uh, does that. However, um, if a believing church or a believing denomination starts to go errant, God does discipline as a loving father, that denomination, so that they wake up. And, and that's what we see in Leviticus 26, the list of blessings and curses there. Um, also in Deuteronomy 28, that, that the, the curses, and you see it in the prophets, I was just reading that this, this week, um, probably in, in Eze, I'm reading in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, I think it, it was in Ezekiel, just about, you know, when God's people go errantly, God sends covenant curses to them so that they will respond. Um, because, as he says in Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. And he's literally talking about dying at the hands of the Babylonians. And, and he's begging them. You know, the reason I haven't sent you rain, the reason that uh, your... your um, villages, uh, small towns all around Judah are, are being ravaged by the Babylonians is because you've forsaken me. Um, Jeremiah says in, in, in 2.14, have you not done this to yourselves by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? Uh, and so that's how we look at this. Uh, with a believing church, God will discipline them out of fatherly love, Hebrews 12. Um, and to an unbelieving church or denomination, um, he will uh, uh, he will judge them and you know essentially put put an end to them. Won't be through physical death <laughs> uh, uh, most likely, uh, but but through um, other kinds of uh, negative consequences. Yeah, Bill. So if we have persecution to, to us as individuals, 
whether at our workplace or mm -hmm. in our neighborhood, that may not be the same as oppression from judgment. So if we come in here with negative stories to tell each other, yeah. we should be on the alert that it could be just persecution for doing what's right, That's right. rather than punishment for doing what's wrong. That's right. So when bad things happen to us, we always discern, is this God's discipline upon me? So let's just assume, you know, we're all believers. So bad things happen and say, is this God's discipline um, upon me? And so we examine our lives. We're, we're um, circumspect. You know, is, is there something I'm doing? Am I treating someone in a certain way? Am I treating a whole bunch of people a certain way? Am I in some kind of sin that I've been excusing in my life and God's trying to get my attention? So we examine that and we say, and sometimes we, we do that and we say, you know, I'm doing actually really well in my faithfulness and love for the Lord and that kind of thing. Um, and so secondly, is this just some kind of thing God wants me to experience for who knows what reason? You know, so I just had surgery three weeks ago and, you know, doing pretty well in faithfulness and that kind of thing. And, 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 uh, it's great, great period in my, my, my life. Not that I have real lows, but um, in terms of faithfulness and all that kind of thing. So it's like, no, this is, you know, the surgery has given me understanding of what it's like to be recovering from surgery and how nice it is when people do things for you. Um, it's given me understanding for, you know, when someone leaves, gets back home from the hospital, they're not instantly better. You know, and I kind of just had that thought in my head. And so God, you know, brings us through different things to help us experience things so that we can be helpful and loving to other people. Um, the other thing can be um, sometimes it's persecution. And that would be specific to I am being treated poorly because of my faith in Christ. And so we never want to attribute, we're saying, oh, we're, they're, being, they're persecuting me when we're just being a jerk or we're, we're being unloving. Okay, we, uh, we, we reserve persecution as Jesus does, as scripture does, for I am proclaiming Christ or living for him and someone's going at me because of those things. And so, you know, Jesus talked about this, you know, the end of the Beatitudes you know, so Matthew 5, uh, 12 through, through 14, blessed are you when men persecute you and say all kinds of ill things against you because of me. For so they prophes for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. Um, so it's uh, join the club. And so, so we want to uh, carefully distinguish when bad things are happening because they could be, could be anywhere kind of in that, that gamut. I think we said about four things there. Yeah, Manny. Would there not be a third, a third for like when you address the like the crippled, the blind, like who came with this man was born this way? Right. Yeah. We'll look at that this morning. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, it, it, who sinned, this man or his parents? And there is an assumption that he was blind because of sin. And actually, we'll deal with that in the sermon that's coming up, not today. Uh, but uh, you know, why do things happen to us? And and the answer is, spoiler alert for the glory of God. Whatever happens to you, it's for God's glory. That's our job on the earth, to bring God glory. That's why we're images of him, to, to reflect him, uh, second, or 1 Corinthians three seventeen, to reflect him in this, in this world and to bring him glory, whether it's through blindness or whether it's through being healed of blindness or whether it's by never being blind and just serving him well with the sight that we have. Okay. Yeah, Matthew. So this may sound bad, so bear with me real quick. Um, we've discussed, you know, how evaluating circumstances to see, you know, if they're A or B or C or D or whatever. Yeah. But I have to ask, how important is it to specifically evaluate circumstances like that when rain falls on the center in, in the in the non center alike. Which can be good and bad. Right. Whether you have crops or whether you're trying to exactly. watch tennis. So PCUSA, I'm sorry, I didn't catch on. 
whether you have crops or whether you are trying to watch tennis. Oh, yes. Rain can be good or bad. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay. Um, so the PCUSA may experience a increase in um, uh, membership, and it may have nothing to do with something they did properly. You know, they may be giving out free Coke and cookies for yeah. communion instead. That's so, right. You know, so it's, you know, you can't really pin it down, to, you know, to that. Right, and so that's that's the answer of Ecclesiastes, which is correct. Right. Solomon says the way the race doesn't go to the swift, but parentheses we misinterpret this. If you look at the context of that, Solomon's argument is it should go to the swift. The best person should always win, and if he doesn't win, that's not fair. But the race doesn't go to the swift. Right, and and I think yeah. that's where uh, that's where I'm going here. So like yeah. we are awesome. We do pretty much everything right. <laughs> of course, yeah. that goes without saying, but thanks for saying it. Yeah, <laughs> but at the same time, we not, and I don't want to use the term blessing, because we, yeah. we're always blessed, but right. we have, you know, we're not, we don't have a new building, we don't have a thousand members, Right. you know, we're not all CEOs and CFOs yep. and CTOs and professional sports players yeah. and stuff like that making millions of dollars yeah. and bad things do happen to us you had you know surgery i've had surgery lots of people have surgery um and but that's yeah. not punishment either right and so it comes so we can spend like our entire you know day thinking well is this punishment is this not punishment is this blessing or is this just luck isn't it a better thing to just say it's there's God's providence, you know, God, God's created all things, he's all powerful, yeah. how do I, in, you know, how do I uh, inspect my own life, how am I, you know, uh, self-reflective, and how does it apply to what I know from the Bible, what I know of God, etc., and so forth, I just, I just feel like we can, and maybe it's just me from a personality standpoint. It just seems like we can spend a lot of time trying to figure out what is what and which, you know, whether one's a blessing, which is a curse, who's being punished, who's not, etc. cetera. Um, when, and that could really kind of take us down the wrong path, so to speak. Kind of direct... That's called anxiety. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I just wrote I these, these four, th <laughs> the four things we talked about up yeah. here. Great summary there, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, and so um, we don't want to be, um, uh, we don't, um, yeah, we, it, it could be any of these things here. And so we just do, we just, we do that, we do that check of, of, you know, is this, is this discipline for something? Is God trying to get my attention um, as believers? So these bottom three are for um, uh, uh, believers. Um, this experience could be for a non-believer, could be something that drives a, a non-believer to, to faith in Christ. Um, bad things happen, and it's like, um, you know, uh, basketball was my God, and then I sprained my ankle the last three years. That didn't happen to me. but And so, you know, I didn't get the college scholarship, and, and so, you know, God can give a, per, uh, you know, one of his people or elect people this experience in order that they come to faith in Christ. But when bad things happen, we can say this could be discipline to me to, to get me to leave some sin, or it could be because I'm doing what's faithful. So these are just, you know, these are the opposites here. Because I'm doing what's faithful, I'm following Christ or I'm proclaiming him, um, I'm getting persecuted. And that's, just note that this is predicted. This is normal. Um, the second, second, uh, Timothy 3.12, and indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, here's the promise, will be persecuted. So it's it's kind of almost valid to say, am I not being persecuted? Therefore, am I not living godly? <laughs> yeah, I don't know that we can completely flip that, but it's it's at least a, a, a interesting question for, for us to, to ask. Yeah, Jim. So could you say that you really don't necessarily know Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, and so sometimes you can say, you know, if I evaluate my life and say, you know what, um, 
this is this is going on in my life and and it's because i'm doing this and i can kind of see the connections there and so we could we could know that and and we could leave that and and god god blesses on a dime he does he doesn't put us through a probation period when we repent he he blesses on a dime he says you know test me you know, and see if i'm good you know and we see it all through the old testament that that or, or saul you know, he doesn't say, well, okay, Saul, you know, it's going to be pretty bad for you for the next four years for all you've done. No, he, he flips him around and starts blessing him, and Paul starts proclaiming the gospel there. Um, yeah, so, uh, and some things, you know, like with experience or or, hard, uh, or just hard things that, that happen here, we don't know why until four years later, or maybe until we see Jesus face to face. Um, you know, some things just don't make sense. You know, I, I was, uh, yeah. The, yeah, Jim. Yeah. So it could even be that it's not even about you. There's something. It could be. Yeah. It on. could be. You're having this experience. You're having this experience for the sake of somebody else. Right. Um, but God's going to be working in you too. Uh, there's going to be something. It's just, you know, God, God has a million reasons. He's doing every little detail. And we just can't, we can't see them all at once. Last question on this and we'll move on. So, and with, with respect to, you, you said mentioned if you repent, you know, blessing on a dime. Yeah. But, but there are things, to, there are holes that we have dug ourselves in sometimes right, exactly. too. And yeah. that's what I, speaking from, you know, personal experience, yeah. experience there's been that discipline and then the blessing has been continual and it may not be what I would think would be like on a dime, 360. Yeah. But he's been faithful and it's a continual yeah. step by step by yeah. step by step by step, et cetera, and so forth. So like the process would be arguably on a dime. Yes. But the other thing too is his timing is entirely different from ours. And yeah. by my own, you know, perspective, it may not be on a dime, but from his perspective, it's yeah. like, yeah. I mean, you live so long in sin and, yeah. you know, this, this turning, has been, you know, seven, eight years long. That to me is on a dime. Matthew just gonna have to live with it, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and um, and so you know that's a good qualification on this. That the the dime part is God's demeanor toward us, and the dime part is what's going on in our soul. But we have, may have external circumstances. We may have done things that have an effect for us, even for the rest of our lives, um, or for another three months or something like that, um, just because. Their physical consequences of the things we've done physically, or maybe we did something that was sinful, like embezzled, and then we've lost our job and we're having trouble getting a new job. You know, that's leftover consequences of sin. Yet God's demeanor has changed toward us, and He's He's working in us and in our souls, that kind of thing. Okay, um, so uh, on re outline of the book uh, to talk about the book of Judges. Um, so, uh, let's see where we are. Are we, Jeff, uh, one, chapter one, verse one, and go ahead and open your Bibles to Judges now, just so we're there and, and looking on it, and then, uh, Jeff, uh, count to ten, and then you can start reading this while we all, while we all find our way to the book of Judges. So we have the first five books of Moses. Through, Deut through Deuteronomy, then Joshua, and then Judges. So we're just kind of going along in a chronological order in Scripture right now. Okay, Jeff. Following conquest of the Promised Land. Okay, so that's the first, uh, the opening section has uh, a record of the faltering conquest. So Joshua, uh, Joshua dies, um, conquest, not all the land was, was obtained as we looked at. Um, a couple weeks ago in the book of Joshua, not all the land was obtained. And so God's people were to continue filling out, uh, conquering the rest of the promised land territories. Um, but this falters. Okay, uh, the next one. Elijah, can you read uh, 3 5 for us, all that's there? Okay. So this is the bulk of the book of Judges. Uh, you've got uh, these cycles of oppression 
and crying out to God and God raises up a judge or a deliverer, a leader for the people, uh, gives them relief, but then they fall back into worshiping other gods and their wickedness and go back into oppression, typically by a new or different nation uh, coming up. And then the third, uh, third section, so just three sections here in the book of Judges. Um, John. 17.1, Anarchy through Levites and Benjamites. Okay. So you have this period of just great anarchy in the last uh, chapters of, of Judges are just crazy, all this stuff that's happening um, there through uh, specifically Levites and Benjamites who are... Um, uh, immoral and wicked and causing problems and doing crazy stuff. Okay, so we're going to take a look at some content to show us these outline points here. So under faltering conquest of the promised land, um, let's go ahead and read. We're at Judges uh, 1. And so let's read Judges 1 verses 1 through 6, an example of faltering conquest. And so let's do one verse at a time. And so Brenda, and then uh, Allie, and then Bill, and then let's come up to the front row here, starting with Mallory. Okay, Judges 1-1. One, one. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah is to go. I have given the land into their hands. Then the men of Judah said to the Simeonites, their brothers, Come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We will turn, no, we in turn, will go with you into yours. So the Simeonites went with them. When Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they struck down 10,000 men at Bezek. It was there that they found Adonai Bezek and fought against him, putting to rout the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Woo! Common, common practice of the day, uh, which we can read about here, but also outside of scripture as well. Um, okay, so what, what happens, what's going on here in these six verses? Well, they're following God's direction of continuing to conquer the promised lands, and they're successful as a yeah, um, so this is successful conquest. Uh, what tribe or tribes? Simeonites and Judah. 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 And they take the Simeonites along with them. Now, if you know a map of the promised land, you know that the land of Simeon, where is it? In Judah. Yeah, it's in Judah. It's surrounded. It's encapsulated by Judah. And so um, if you, you, know, you can look in your, your Bible uh, maps there. Or you can look at this great illustration that I'm about to put up here. Uh, so you got, um, okay, so Promised Land, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. Um, and then so about here, you've got uh, Judah comes down here. Judah's the southern territory. Uh, but in the middle of Judah is Simeon. Okay. Um, Jerusalem's like here. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, now, original audience, who's this being written to? What time? Who's this being written to? Saul Davidish. Saul Davidish. What tribe is Saul from? Benjamin. What tribe is David from? Judah. When the people ask who should go up, who should take care of this? Who steps up? Judah. Judah. So should you choose the sons of Saul or the sons or David as your king? David. David. See how that works? Okay. Um, so in this section of faltering conquest, who's not faltering? Judah. Judah. Who didn't falter as a general under King Saul? David. David. Uh, what did, where was Saul when, when um, uh, Goliath was taunting the armies of the living God. In his tent. He was in his tent way at the back. And you see this with Saul. When there, are, when there are attacks, sometimes Saul doesn't even know the battle has started because his tent is so far back from the battle line. 
In contrast to this, David is in front of the Israelite troops fighting Goliath. Okay, so who will go up? And David says, I will. Okay, so you see that parallel. This is, this is one of the things that uh, the author of Judges is, is shown. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so is it a bad thing? Like if, if the Lord says Judah's to go and Judah says, hey, does somebody else want to come with me? Is that a bad thing? So how does Judah act in this situation? So Judah has Simeon go with Judah. And so is that good or, or bad? What, ha, how, is, how, how would we evaluate that? Think of the original audience. Good. Good. What does Judah do? A good thing or a bad thing for Simeon? Good thing. Good. Come under my wing, Simeon. We'll get these guys. We'll get your territory for you. That's exactly what David does. Um, he he fights for all of he fights for all of Israel, um, and so yeah. Does that get at it, Laura? Again, original audience. Ask you know. Let's say I, what does this mean? And this is Judah is the tribe that fights successfully, and that gains territory for other tribes too. Okay? And guides it's, them to do the right thing with them. Yeah. Guides them to do the right thing with them. Yeah, Matthew. And, and I would say it's also pretty clear that there's no promise or implication that they're going to carve out land outside of what's already been uh, what's out like already been promised. If Judah's like, "Help me conquer my land," I'll help you conquer your land. There's no uh, there's no like meritorious land splitting based on who participates. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it, what we're to, um, you know, what we're to see here is the same thing we saw in, in Genesis. Um, Benjamin's threatened to be a slave to Joseph for life. And who is it that steps up and says, take me? Judah. Judah. He's the protective brother, uh, the one who means goodness and blessing for his brothers. Okay. Um, all right, um, Allison, did you see this? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, um, so Judah is successful um, there. Now let's read Judges 1, 27 through 36. And so we'll just continue on uh, with where we were. So uh, verse 27. So let's go over to um, uh, Anna. So Judges 1, 27, and then... Charlene, and then Bob, and then Matthew, and on across until we're through 36. So 127, Judges 127. <clears throat> but Manasseh, Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shem or Panahash or Dor or Ebalim or Megiddo and their surrounding set settlements for the Canaanites were determined to live in the land. What's the contrast there? They're not, they're not, they're not conquering. Another tribe tries and they fail. Okay. Yeah, okay, go ahead. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nephalo, who remained among them, but they did subject them to forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Alab or Agzib or Helba or or you guys are doing great with these names. Really? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, but they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath, but the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land. And those living in Beth Shemesh, Shemesh and Beth Anath, he 
became forced labor with us for it. The Air Rights confined the Dinamites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plains. And the Amorites were determined also to hold out in Mount Paris, Ajalon, and Sheldon, but were both within the power of the house of Joseph and priests, they too were pressed into forced labor. The boundary of the Amorites was from the Scorpion Pass to Sela and Okay. So what's happening here? Everyone else is failing to push other other people out. Yeah. So all these other tribes are, are listed here and, and they're unable to rid the promised land, a land set apart for worshipers of God. They leave people who are not worshiping God uh, there in the land. Um, and so faltering conquest there. Question. Yeah. So if they could get them into forced labor. Matthew, look. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> They were not finishing the job. That's right. Yep, so that was the, the Joshua the Joshua mandate. Clear the land of these people, men, women, and animals. Get them out. Um, and, 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 you know, totally extinguish them as a burnt offering. As the same, same word um, uh, un, unto me. As an act of worship. Um, because this was, pun this was God's punishment upon the Canaanites because of their wickedness. These weren't nice people that are being displaced unfairly. Um, in fact, in Genesis 15, when God gives and grants the promised land to Abraham, he says, but I'm not going to give it to you now. One of the reasons is because their sin doesn't deserve yet this being extinguished. But your descendants will go down into Egypt, and after that they'll come out, and then their, my wrath against them will have reached its full measure. And so the, the um, uh, Israelites were the, um, uh, you know, the extinguishers of you know, the, the, the Nazis and the Joseph Stalins and those who were causing great evil um, on the face of the earth. Yeah. Okay, um, so faltering conquest there. Um, uh, is shown in the, the first section of uh, Judges. Next sections are cycle of oppression. Um, and so uh, let's do uh, this. Um, Sydney, could you read the very bottom um, thing there, starting with the word read? Uh, read Judges 2, 16, 19. An introduction and preview of the cycle of oppression. Okay, so let's go to uh, chapter 2. Verses uh, 6 through 19. And so, um, Joyce, let's start with you, and then we'll, we'll work up again on this side from back, to, from back to front. So starting with Judges 2, 6 through 19. These are, uh, this is an example of the cycles of oppression. They forsook him and served Baal and the Asherah. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave him into the hand of raiders who plundered him. He sold him into the hands of their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to deliver him. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them, and bring great distress. 
Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of the beat the way of obedience to the Lord's command. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies, as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them, as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Okay, so what happens here? What do we what do we see? It got worse. Yeah, worse. Yeah. Uh huh. And they don't learn. They don't learn. Uh huh. They were disciplined. They are disciplined. Yeah. How are they disciplined? By foreign nations. Yeah, foreign nations doing what? Oppressing them. Again. Yeah, coming into the land and oppressing them. Yeah. Uh, so. They follow after other gods, they go into wickedness, they get oppressed, they cry out, God gives them a deliverer, he delivers them, but the people soon go into wickedness and worshiping other gods and get oppressed again. So this goes over and over. So this is kind of a, you know, a summary here. The beginning of this is a you know, summary. It's not chronological here. It's back, it takes us back to the end of Judges there where Joshua dies, and then explains kind of the whole setup for this. Yeah, Bill. Why were they called judges? Was there a um, like a, a political office that they were occupying as as a judge? Yeah, that can be. It can be the word. It, it's, it's shafat is the word. It can be translated judge or leader, um, and, and so they're kind of a little bit of, of both. One of the things that we see is in ancient societies, unlike the United States and uh, Britain, the office of, of executive, uh, you know, or, or of, uh, yeah, the executive branch of government and the judicial branch are not separated. Okay, and so who who judges between the two women who are claiming this live baby is theirs? The king. The king Solomon does. David judges. Right, and Nathan comes up to David and says, "I've got a case to bring to you. You know, there was a man who had one sheep and loved this sheep and that kind of thing. And then there's a wealthy man, and he come and took took the sheep from this other one. This is because David was the supreme court, the king in in kingships. The king is the supreme court of the land, um, and so." This is the, the kind of thing that's going on with the book of Judges that God raises up a leader. And it's really, we translated that early into English in, in terms of English translations into Judges. They're really more leaders than they are judges, but Judges is also part of that. Yeah. So good, good question there. Yeah, Jim. So in that generation, Is that more a statement about them and their hearts, or is that a statement of those elders not teaching, or is it some of both? It's both, yeah. And so the, the people rise up after Joshua, and, and they hadn't seen the Lord deliver them, you know, in, in the promised land, and and so they're they're unfaithful, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, Laura. How long is this period? Because you've got generations. Yeah, it, it, it depends. Uh, um, the uh, 200 years or 400 years we're not we're not sure um it, it could be either and nothing theologically really rests on it yeah, yeah allison um, now to kind of go back to your question matthew from earlier okay. with um evaluating okay. your life could we say that it's a good habit or it's a good thing that things happen even if it mean, means nothing because we just tend to forget to yeah. do things right. Yeah. God's always developing us. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. things work together for the good uh, for those who love him and have been called. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a salvation word, called. That's a lot of, uh, um, effectual calling there. 
a called according to his purpose. So all things he's building into our lives. You know, so, um, you know, when I was at, at college, I was uh, pre-dent, so I, you know, I had a year of, uh, a year of biology, two years of chemistry, a uh, year of physics, um, and then I took an English major with a history minor, not knowing I'd go into ministry, but guess what? I can talk to Bill about physics stuff because I had a year of physics, you know, and, I can, and, and, you know, at the time I was taking it, I didn't know that was why, you know, and I can talk to English majors and history majors and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and that's, that's helpful. So all these things that God has happened in our lives, we recognize as the sovereign hand of God. And he has a purpose for it. And a lot of times we don't know that purpose right then and there. But we figure it out a little bit later. We say, oh, okay, I get it. I went through this. Um, because when I went through this, it caused these things to happen. And that's why I'm here today doing this um, thing for the Lord or, or whatever. Yeah, man. I, I, I don't know if this is an explicitly Christian thing certainly you see this in non-Christians, and I don't have any scripture to support it, but the very act of reviewing your actions, your heart, your intentions, etc., is a blessing in and of itself because, mm -hmm. you know, God has given you the ability to discern, you know, yeah. some of that as well. Yeah. And and so, I would say, and, th and this is where, it, you know, it's nebulous and certainly just my opinion, I would say, like, the true blessing there is in the act, not necessarily coming to the correct conclusion, but in the act of evaluation and knowing God is in control of all things. God is the provider of both blessing and curse. Yeah. You know. Yeah. One one of the things that that hard events cause us to see it it grows us in understanding the sovereignty of God, and that you know as I uh, you know one person uh, that I that I knew who was trying to justify divorcing her husband without biblical justification for doing this is she said, I know God just wants me to be happy. <laughs> right. Um, Maybe she just fell out of love with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, it's no, God wants you to be faithful. That's what we know from scripture. God wants you to be faithful. Um, and, you know, I don't know that Jesus was happy on the cross. I don't know that Paul was happy when he was getting pelted with stones and left for dead outside the city wall. Um, you know, and we, and we don't have that in Scripture. God wants me to be happy. Um, we have, you know, that God uh, blesses us, but he wants us to be faithful. And we're to, we're to trust the, the outcome and our circumstances to him. And so when bad things happen, we, we get out of this uh, simplistic uh, black and white view of when I do good things, God blesses me with, and, and I'm going to define what blessing is. Um, we, we get out of that. That's prosperity gospel there. And, and that's what Solomon obliterates in the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, you know, so my maybe my favorite two verses in, in scripture, maybe my favorite verse in scripture is you know, Ecclesiastes eight eight thirteen, which says there's some, something else meaningless that occurs on earth. In other words, it in appearance it just makes no sense. We wouldn't have predicted it. That's what Solomon means when he says meaningless. You can't connect consequence with action, action to consequence. And that's what life is like. You're just not sure. Sometimes the fastest person wins the race. Sometimes the slow, sometimes the, the, the you know, one time, uh, sometime in the recent 20 years, someone from Greece won the 100 meter dash. <laughs> yeah, and it's just a fluke thing. They were feeling great that day and all the faster runners had a bad race. Um, and, and um, but, uh, he says, you know, there's something else meaningless that occurs on the earth. Um, righteous men, it's this, righteous men who get the wicked man's reward and, and wicked men who get the righteous man's reward. This too, I say, is meaningless. That's the verse. Uh, and so you just, you just don't know. You know, sometimes you do what's right 
and you get persecuted and you lose your life for it. But we understand as, as Christians with this book, that's what happened to Jesus, and why should I expect any better? Right? We have more wisdom than just, than just saying, I'm being a good Christian, so good things should happen to me. You know, it's like, well, if you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. You know, and so it's just, it's more nuanced than that. So we've got four things that we look at about when bad things are happening to me. Yeah, Joyce. And as you get older, that verse. Um, so you've heard. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Second Corinthians one. Yeah. It's like you see somebody in her suffering, you can help others. Yeah. You can say you can make it because you can help them. Yeah, it, it's really true, and, and I just I I think, um, yeah, just to underline that, um, I know so many things that have happened to me that are hard. I just I just I come to learn. Oh. You know, Randy's going through this now, you know, or Manny's going through this now. I can help him. I've been there. I, I know what this is like. I can't say my experience is exactly like, you know, his or hers or wh whatever, but, um, but, but, but we can help. And, and, and that's more important than our life being, uh, you know, zippity doo dah, zippity day, my oh my, what a wonderful day. <laughs> you know, just plenty of sunshine coming my way. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it really is. We we comfort those. Jo Joyce was quoting, you know, Second Corinthians uh, one one. Um, you know, we comfort those with the comfort we ourselves have received, and and so we can tell people, you know, you're going to make it through this, um, and it's okay. And God is not this bad thing happening to you. That doesn't mean God's abandoned you. And that's, that's a big point in the Old Testament prophets. You're going to be exiled, but he's going to bring you back because he's not abandoning you as his people. He's just disciplining you through this covenant curse of exile. Um, but he won't, he won't abandon you forever. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's end there. Um, and we'll take a look at some of the content uh, in the, the, the chaos with the Levites and Benjamites uh, next, next week. Uh, let's pray. By the way, I want to say this to you. When someone's going through hardship, um, d mourn with them. Mm -hmm. That's your job. And, and the, the, the book of Job is all about that. It's not time to say, hey, it's going to be good. Isn't this good this happened? Because God's going to have some great you know, usefulness for you in the end. Not when they're going through it. Read Job, and, and, and you'll, find, you'll find out that's exactly that. The reason the comforters are terrible is because they quit. They're initially very good comforters to him. And they go, oh, this is so awful. And when someone's going, so, you know, so here, here's, here's my process as a pastor. I teach you about the sovereignty of God, about God's control, about his goodness, and that kind of thing, so that when hardship comes to you, you're not so damaged by it, and you don't question your faith. But when hardship comes to you in that midst, I'm not telling you, hey, it's going to be in this great because now he's going to be able to use you in all these ways and you're going to be able to help other people. No, say, as the Scottish would say, or Irish would say, save it. Um, highlighted for us by Mike Myers, I think. Uh, <laughs> save it um, and allow them to see it years later. Um, and, and when it's going on, just sit with them. Sit with them and say, hey, I'm really sorry this is going on. Um, and, and, and mourn with them. That's what they need. If you've been through hard circumstances and had people do that with you, you know, I remember, um, uh, you know, when, when we had, you know, uh, the, uh, terrible, the terrible things 10 years ago that happened, to our church and people recruiting people out of the church in wickedness uh, and all that did to us. I remember people sitting with me and, and saying, you know, Jeff Bradford at our sister church at uh, Christ the King, he said, can I just buy you lunch? And we sat there in um, the pit, you know, in Raleigh. And, and he said, hey, I just want to tell you, I'm angry for you. 
I'm mad that this has happened. Um, and that was so healing for me. You know, other people did similar things for me. They just said, you know, and, and people seeing me at General Assembly and saying, oh, John, I'm so sorry this is going on. Uh, and, and that's what people need when they're hurting. They just need you to know that, that they need they need to know that you care. They know that. But, but give them that. Um, say, hey, I just care. Yeah, I saw Leonard Bailey at, at GA. Uh, and, and he was assistant pastor at our mother church. And, and their daughter was killed on uh, about Route 95 on an interstate coming home one night about a year ago, a year and a half. And I was just standing in line, it's, you know, getting coffee and some muff, muffin with, with Leonard in line. And, and I said, Hey, <laughs> don't know what to say, but, but, you know, we're, we're sad with you, you know, about this, you know, I lost his daughter, you know, and he said, it's all you need to say. Um, so, so just, just know that even though we know we're talking about now, God is sovereign and he works good things through us, through the suffering we go through. Um, the suffering is really, the suffering stinks and it's okay to say, the suffering stinks. And it's okay to say to the person who's going through suffering, this really stinks and I wish it weren't happening to you. My dad used to say when I was sick, he'd get, he'd come to me in my little bunk bed and he'd say, oh, John, if I could be sick for you, I would. And he meant it. You know, that gave me, that gave me strength. Um, so, you know, just, just know, don't, don't have happy solutions for people, even though God's in control. Um, it's not just not the time. Just have timing with that. Can you tell I've had girls? <laughs> Boys, you can say, you knucklehead, what are you thinking? Right there. You know, they can even have friends around. And, and you know, when you're, when you're dealing with, with girls, you say, okay, I got to store this away for some other time, you know, and, and then talk, talk to her about this in a gentle way, you know, later. Um, because right now is not the time. Okay.